The good news according to Luke, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The good news of the Lord. Dear sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Luke, more than any other gospel writer, emphasizes the importance of prayer in his gospel. And it starts with Jesus in a certain place. We don't know where it is, but Jesus is in a certain place praying. And then one of his disciples says, well, teach us how to do this, which is one of my goals in life. Why do you think I, I have a prayer with the children? And I say a phrase and they repeat it. And the phrase, I'm trying to teach them to pray as well as the rest of you. Jesus teaches in three ways. He gives a model prayer to start with that we see. He gives a parable about prayer. And then he has some sayings about prayer. And it's really very difficult. So as, as a fellow Christian, I don't come as a pastor with answers. I come as a fellow Christian with questions like you do. The Lord's Prayer is first, and Jesus invites his disciples into a deeply personal relationship with God. Jesus says, you can call him Father, Abba. That's our first snag in the text. What if your father was abusive? What if your father was cruel and unloving? It's hard then for a person to overcome that image of father when they're trying to pray to a loving God. Once again, we return to the context in which Jesus is saying. Jesus is trying to find a human way of understanding the relationship with God, and so he's using a parent as an example of how that is. But maybe we need to think of Father as someone else in our lives. It's about relationship. Maybe it's your favorite aunt. Maybe it's your favorite uncle. Think of that then as you pray. Think of praying to that one who has loved you so dearly that you adore. Jesus is emphasizing relationship and whoever you call upon to think about as you pray to this loving, kind, gracious God, that's okay. God understands that. Jesus is saying to call on God as a child calls on a loved one. <clears throat> that's what he's talking about, relationship. To call on the one who wants to give good things and to give life. And Jesus continues with the phrase, and it's really an important phrase. If human parents who are sinners know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will our loving God give us good gifts? I've used that phrase so many times in my understanding of God's love for the whole world, for everyone in the whole world. If I, as a human sinner, can love all of those others, how much more does God love them? And he said, God will give you the greatest gift of all, the Holy Spirit, so that you have the power to believe and to understand. And then Jesus tells us to pray to God to keep God's name holy. Hallowed be thy name. When God's name is holy, 
kept holy. And when God's kingdom comes, the result is that there is bread for all. And the result is that forgiveness is practiced by all. When we keep God's name holy and we ask the kingdom to come, there is bread, there is forgiveness. And then God delivers the faithful from the time of trial. But then Jesus goes into a parable, and this is one that's in our culture not real easy to understand either. A parable that tells us that we can trust on God to give us the right answer and to respond to our need. It's important because this guest arrived at midnight and the host doesn't have any food. Now remember we've talked even last week about the importance of hospitality in this culture. Uh, hospitality is a high standard and you cannot break the rule of hospitality. It just simply cannot be done. So when the host does not have enough bread, he goes to his neighbor. Glad I'm not his neighbor. Midnight, knocking on the door saying, I need some bread. We, res we uh, agree with the response of the neighbor. Do not bother me. That's, I think we all agree. That's kind of a nuisance. He's really pushing his limits of friendship. And whenever I talk about friendship, I remember my dear friend, classmate of seminary who has passed away since, who always said, just remember, a friend in need is a pest. <laughs> but in this culture, it is the neighbor who is acting badly. It's the neighbor who is not being hospitable. The host's honor is at stake because he has a friend who's come and he has no hospitality to show him. So his honor is at stake. So he goes to his neighbor to make the request. And the neighbor eventually gives in, as Jesus says, not because he is his friend, but because he has no choice unless he wants to bring shame on himself for his inhospitality and shame on his neighbor. So he has to get up and do it. Hospitality required it. If he had not gotten up, he would have shamed himself and his friend. How much more, then, will God give us the gifts that we need? And now we come to this really hard part of the text, that I simply don't know how we deal with it. Ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Because everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Receives what? Receives what they ask for, or receives what God wants them to have? Seeking what you want and finding it, or finding what God's going to provide for you? Because our experience in life is such that we know that there are times when we have asked and not received. There have times when we have prayed fervently and the answer was no. So our experience kind of says this text, how do, we, how do we live out this text in our own personal experience? There have been many times in my life when the answer was a, a wonderful yes, when it gave life and it was good, but there have been times when there was no answer at all. You know that. Our life experience says, is this true, that if we ask, we will receive, seek and we will find, knock and it will be opened? When we pray for health and safety, when we pray for cancer to go away, when we pray for protection from senseless accidents of our children and our loved ones, when we pray for people around the world and there's still violence, there's still hunger, there's still disease, there's still natural disasters. We pray, we seek, we knock. And sometimes nothing happens. So the question I came up with, why pray? If your prayers aren't going to be answered, what is the point of praying? When prayers seem to go unanswered, is there a point then in praying? There's no simple answer, and there are some simple answers that people give that I really don't care for. One of them is that God has three answers, yes, no, and maybe later. That doesn't, that doesn't say anything to, about, to my pain when I'm going through watching a loved one suffer. Yes, no, maybe later. I don't like that one. 
The other one I don't like is, well, you just didn't have enough faith. Really? That's a good answer to someone who's sitting beside the bedside of their child dying of cancer and they're not cured, and the response is, you didn't have enough faith. Really? That is identifying compassionately with the pain of, of a loved one who's suffering to say, well, you just didn't have enough faith. That doesn't deal with the issue. It doesn't deal with the, the text either. If we, what we ask for is not good for us, then we say, well, God says no. What's not good about saving your child from cancer? So our, our point is that we need to be in tune with God's will. And that's not always easy to know. We have to trust God's will for our lives. Scripture says that it is God's will that everyone have enough to eat. It is God's will that violence and war cease in the world. It is God's will that we have daily bread. It is God's will that the kingdom shall come. And yet millions are starving. War is still going on. There's still violence. Another response that I don't care for is everything happens for a reason. Really, what good reason is it that your four-year-old child should die of cancer? Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, God can take something bad and something good can come out of it. We know that. We've had that experience in our lives, too, that something was bad, we just didn't understand it, and all of a sudden, there is something that good that comes out of it. I always think of one example in Madagascar. If there's a cyclone in East Africa, rain comes to southwest Madagascar, where there's drought and desert. So the suffering in East Africa brings rain to Madagascar. That's an example of something that's bad and something good comes out of it. But I do not like the response that everything happens for a reason, because we don't always understand the reason. Everything happens for a reason. Is that comforting? When someone says, oh, there's a reason that this person died. There's a reason that that 21-year-old was killed on a motorcycle out on Highway 20. Has God got some purpose for everything that happens? Maybe. Maybe God has his will working in there somewhere. But is it then that everything that happens is God's will? I don't think so. Because I don't think cancer is God's will. I don't think violence, war, and premature death is God's will either. Yes, God can bring good things out of evil. And we know that through the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. The good that came out of that suffering was there. But what about unanswered prayer? True, God is all-powerful. But God's power is not used in every situation. There are other powers in this world, are there not? Powers of evil, powers of hatred, powers of discrimination that are all against God. I love it when we have the baptismal liturgy and it says, do you renounce the devil and all the devil's works and ways? And we say, we do. We know that God has won the ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. And that's where we take our stand and we stay there. But the battle still rages against God. The darkness still wants to overcome the light. God will not let it happen, but the darkness never gives up trying. So there are still bad things that happen. So why pray? Because we are invited into a relationship with a God who loves us, a God who wants to talk with us, a God who wants to listen to us, a God who wants to give us life. And that's the ultimate answer of God in all of this, is that God promises the final word, life. Not everything that happens is God's will, yet we believe God is present in all things. Prayer is not getting what we want, like chocolate chip cookies. Prayer turns us away from ourselves and helps us direct ourselves to God. When we are in prayer, we are directing ourselves to communicating with our loving God. The Lord's Prayer pulls us away from ourselves and pushes us toward God. The parable tells us to be persistent in prayer. I think we can. We can, we can pray boldly. 
when it's something we need, when it's something we want, we can lay it on God's feet boldly. Be persistent. So why pray? Where else should we go? That's what Peter said. Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So why should we pray? Because there's no other place to go except to God. Praying leaves us in the arms of God. Whatever is happening, the good, the bad, whatever is happening, prayer leaves us in God's arms. I do not know the answers to these questions about prayer, but I knew, do know that that's really the only place we can go. There's no other place that gives us that kind of love, that kind of grace, the promises of God. And God's final word is the ultimate word, and it's life. Some of the rest between now and then, we don't understand. But we know God's there. Amen.